The reading for today is Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14 on page 1052. The parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Morning. In the, the Old Testament, the, the word for um, God's breath is ruach, which is wind. So I'm pleased that it wasn't the physical wind that brought you here this morning, but the spiritual wind of the Holy Spirit. So I'm glad you're here. And um, let's just pray before we think about Psalm 27, which you've got actually on your table and those sheets. You might like those sheets handy. Father, we thank you for the breath of your Holy Spirit, and we pray as we think about Psalm 27, as we think about our relationship with you, that you would speak to each one of us and speak to us as a group of, of, of your followers here. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I don't know whether you've taken time recently to think about your relationships, you know, with your spouse, with, uh, you know, child to parent, parent to child, siblings. Sometimes you're forced to think about your relationship, aren't you? Um, I remember when I, I was uh, uh, kind of looking after my mother, who was in her uh, kind of 80s and, and had um, uh, a dementia kind of setting on. And I struggled. I couldn't work out why I was kind of sweetness and light to any older person at church where I was. But my mother, there was something in me that just, and I got quite angry. Um, and, and it was that kind of changer. I'd become the parent, and she'd become the child. And it was hard, and I had to re-examine my relationship with my mum. But I have to say, a few days before she died, she, I, I was putting her, her, her kind of slipper on, and, and she kissed me on the back of the neck, you know? A mother's kiss for a child. And that kind of re-established, you know, the relationship. But, but sometimes it's something like that that forces you to think about your relationship, or, or maybe you just spend time. Well, here we are in Lent, and the relationship that we're thinking about and should think about is the one we have with our Heavenly Father. And we have time in Lent to do that. Lent shouldn't be a busy time. It should be a time when we take space, a time for examining God. How do we see Him? How does He see us? Is he a priority? Is his relationship with us a priority? How does our use of time, money, skills, or lives show that importance? Where is the evidence in our lives that that relationship is the most important one that we have? The Psalms are a wonderful guide to the relationship that we can have with our Heavenly Father. They're both a personal account, David's account of his relationship with God. And it's an interesting one from, from utter love and praise to saying to God, why don't you wake up and save me? You know? So it, all, all those things, right? He rages against God as well as, as showing his love. But it's also not just a personal one. It's one that God's people and we have to share. It's the history of of. of God's people and their relationship as well. So it's all of that. And I want to look at Psalm 27 now. And there are five images, five actually structures that the psalmist uses, 
All of which, I think, give us an insight into that relationship. And the first one is fortress or stronghold. Fortress, in the NIV, it says stronghold, okay? Have the picture of, I don't know, a hill fort or the walls around, well, the few walls left around Chichester, for example, or you can think of other walled cities. A place of protection, a place that you run to, that's certainly true of hill forts, is that you had your life outside of it. You didn't spend all your time in the hill fort. But when danger threatened, up you went with your family and your possessions, and you were safe. I hesitate to use this word, but it was your backstop. <laughs> it was literally that. It was where you went when there was no other option. You went to the fortress. You went to, to that, that, that stronghold. And there you were safe. So that's the first image in that psalm of, 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 of God, that God is a stronghold for us. You can trust in him, whatever the situation is, to save you. Whenever you feel overwhelmed, and let's again be honest with each other, there are times when we feel overwhelmed. Personal grief, illness, worry for our children, worry for our parents, whatever it is. Loss of, loss of income, loss of home, loss of everything that we valued. There are some families, and we know a family at the moment that we're praying for, uh, that, that we've known for, for a number of years, and everything that could go wrong in their family has gone wrong in their family. And you want to cry out to God, why? Why? You know, one problem, one illness, one person in hospital, but not three of them or whatever it is. And you cry out at God. That God is our, our, our strong place, our fortress. So a key aspect of our relationship is to know that we have God we can turn to. We trust in him that whatever happens, we will not be overwhelmed. In that very first verse, or in the psalm, or fairly on, it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I fear? There is nothing on earth that we need be frightened of. It's a relationship that requires our trust. That's the first structure. The second, verse 4, 4a, house. One thing I ask from the Lord, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. Now that word house, perhaps we could better translate it and put home. All right? It's not just the building. It's not just bricks and mortar. It's a home. It's where God dwells. I love that word. We don't often use the word dwell. We might talk about dwelling on something. But that, that sense of, of, of being rooted in that place. Home is where God dwells. It's a picture of a place of welcome, of hospitality that we're invited to by God. We don't have the, uh, the you know, we're not um, uh, privileged in one sense. We're not, we don't have any right to, to, to be in God's presence in, in, in his house. But God invites us. Where do you feel at home? Where do you feel at home? That's rhetorical, so you don't have to answer me. But think about it. Where do you feel at home? Is it actually the four walls that surround you? Is it um, a place that, that you're attached to? You know? Is it a mountain, a lockside in my case, or whatever? A place where you feel close to? Is it a person? I know that my children who've had to, to move around quite a bit with, with, with the job that, that, that Bobby and I have had. Um, and home comes to be where we are, not the physical place. So it, it varies, all right? But where God dwells, that makes his home. And we're invited to come with him. It isn't a distant place. It's not even just a breath away. You don't have to wait to have the intimacy Actually, the promise is that he dwells in us, in our hearts. David wrote, I have loved the dwelling place of your house. David is talking about the intimacy of his relationship with God. He's not talking about a building. 
And we think about that, the key aspect of any relationship has to be spending time with people. Spending time with the person, persons that you love. Without that, you don't develop anything. You don't develop love. You develop acquaintanceship. That's about it. So it's about actually being uh, in that spending time. Are you too busy to stop and listen to God? Actually, often we're very busy praying, but we're too busy to listen. Are we too distracted about the pressures of life? Are we too busy to accept the invitation? Come and sit with me a while. A relationship requires feeding to grow. So we've had a, a, a fortress or safe a, a stronghold, a house. Thirdly, temple. Verse 4b. To gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Now, a temple is a place of worship in God's presence. It's where heaven meets earth. At least it was for the Jewish people at this time of, of David. But of course, the physical temple wasn't built until after David's time. It was Solomon who built it. And it was a magnificent building. It had a, a, a liturgy, a, a pattern to it, which, which drew people to God. The outer courts were where, you know, everybody could, could actually mingle and, and, and mix. We know that from the New Testament, you know, and the outer courts where people had, had stalls and everything else there. And then the, the priests, the Levites, were allowed to go into the inner courts, but no one else. And then right at the core of it was the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest once a year could go into it. So you can see that, that kind of movement to that kind of presence of God. The temple created a call to worship. It was designed for worship. An opportunity to come with thanksgiving, recognize our own faults and so on. But that all changed, didn't it, with Jesus? What I wanted for this morning, but we couldn't really set it up, was to have a camera on you lot, all right? And when it came up temple, you were going to be up there because that's the church. That is, that is, if, if you like, the temple post-Jesus or, or post-Jesus' is, is, is humanity with us, all right? It's not the building. It's not this building. It's not that lovely building up there. It's us. We are the church. Church buildings have not been replaced. Remember that, that that temple that Solomon built was actually destroyed twice, finally, by the Romans in AD 70. Even that wasn't permanent. But the temple in our hearts is. Paul wrote in Corinthians, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? All right? That's where, that's where God meets with us in our hearts. Which means... That he not only meets with us on a Sunday, but actually at work, by your desk, or you're standing in front of all those children wondering what on earth am I going to teach them today, or whatever. Or whatever you're doing this week, God is with you. You don't have to wait till Sunday to get your, your kind of fill up. So the key aspect of our relationship with God is one about giving God his true worth. That's what the word worship means. It means worth-ship. It's, a, it's a, a very old kind of Saxon word, worth-ship. Give God his true worth. And that should be our motivation for all that we do. Our motivation for our work, our use of time, our caring for the lost, and so on. Okay. Fourth one, then. Right. Verse 5a. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. That word in the original, in the Hebrew, is the word sukkot, right? which is booth. Okay? It doesn't mean a photo booth or anything like that. It actually was a shelter built of branches. If you have been to Israel at the time of the Feast of the Tabernacles, or Feast of the Booths, you'll be surprised by the number of cars that are driving on the road covered with branches. All right? And you look up to people's balconies, and they've, got, they've created a shelter because in the Feast of Tabernacles, 
uh, which was begun by Moses, uh, the, the Jewish people actually remember the time in the wilderness when they had to make do with whatever they could find to give them shelter. So for the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling or whatever. The Feast of Booths. What does that tell us about our relationship with God? God's inviting us in his booth. It says that God shares in the vulnerable nature of our lives. God understands exactly what it's like when we're struggling with life. He understands danger, pain, loss, grief, bereavement, homelessness, suffering, the pilgrim life, all that comes with humanity. There isn't one thing that is hidden from God in our lives. He knows our fears. He knows our joys. Uh, there isn't one thing that we've thought, said, or done that he doesn't know. And do you know what? He still loves us. He still gets excited when we choose to have a relationship with him because that relationship to him is so important. Nothing shocks or surprises our God. No threat or issue is too big for him. Nothing is too insignificant for him. He understands what we're like and what we're going through. And he wants to be with us. He wants to come alongside us. That, for me, is at the heart of, that, uh, of the, the Luke story of, of the Pharisee and the tax collector. There is the Pharisee who, who thinks he has a, an ordained, literally, right to be okay before God. He can tick all the boxes, but he's utterly dishonest. And there is a tax collector who knows that he is beyond the pale, right? The people that are hated by everybody else. And he, in that story, he's of the two, he is the one who is vulnerable and honest. He says, I am no good. I've done all these things. And that is the person, Jesus said, who actually, you know, receives God's righteousness. So a relationship with God requires honesty and being vulnerable. Be prepared to be vulnerable. And lastly, the tent, 5B. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent. Now, a tent was very significant to the Jewish people. Remember that when they were 40 years in the wilderness, uh, it, uh, it, it was the, and, and God came to, to actually be present with them, it was in the tent of meeting. Moses made a tent of meeting. So whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance to their tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. What a beautiful picture. So the tent was, was there where, where Moses and others, uh, Moses particularly, met with God. And to me, that shows God's desire to be at the heart of his people. It's like us saying to God, I fancy going camping. And God says, yeah, I want to come camping too. It's about that willing to, to willingness of God to be with us. Because our God is a God of movement. He's a God of change. There's that, that old hymn that, that has the, the glorious verse, which if you're singing it at, at a dirge-like speed in a cold church, and the line goes, and nothing changes here, all right? Um, sometimes churches don't change, but I tell you, God is a God of change and movement. And that tent image is a picture because a tent is, is or should be something that you only use for a short space of time. And the tent, you can get up and move and go somewhere else. And the relationship we have with God is one in which we should be ready to move when God challenges us to change, to move. It, you know, we have a tented God. He's not a static God, and neither should our relationship be. So if we're sitting there thinking, yeah, I haven't got a bad relationship with God, you know, I, actually, when was the last time we thought about doing something a bit different in that relationship, spending a bit more time, doing something totally outside of our comfort zone, all right? We're very bad in church of sticking our comfort zones, all right? You know, we may not have a physical pew, but I tell you what, we sit in exactly the same place when we come to worship, all right? Metaphorically, if not literally, we have a God who moves, a relationship which requires us to be open to change. So five structures, which I hope give an insight into the way of our relationship might develop. So to conclude, God chose to have earthly addresses 
in order to be at the very heart of our lives. Secondly, Psalm 27 teaches us that God is our fortress who protects us. God is our house where we can come home to. God is our temple where we can meet him in worship. God is our booth with whom we can be totally vulnerable with. And God is our tent who enables us to be a people on the move. We're going to have just a a short time when I I want you to do some thinking and and responding. On your table, there should be enough uh, Psalm 27 sheets and enough pencils or pens for you to do something for me. All right? I'm going to introduce you to, it it seems an unfortunate name, but it is called the Swedish method of Bible study. All right? The first thing I'll ask you to do is I will want you to pick out one, that's one aspect, one word, one phrase, one verse, one idea in reading that psalm and the way we've thought about it that strikes you as something, maybe for the first time, something you go, yes, it's a bit like God has underlined or highlighted something for you. All right, now, now don't have to, just listen to me first, right? All right, Kathy, all right, don't start yet. It's like an exam, all right? Don't start your paper yet. Um, uh, will you draw the briefest of light bulbs again? It's a light bulb moment, right? You don't have to be a perfect artist to draw a light bulb, okay? LED, whatever you want, a light bulb, okay? That's the first thing. And the second thing is, if there is um, uh, uh, something in there that, that you, you, you question, you want to know more about, all right? challenges you and you think about it, you want, you want to, uh, maybe it's something you don't understand, anything that, that you want to know more about, will you put a question mark against it? You might have several of those, I don't know. A question mark. And the third one is this. If there is something in there, something that I've said, something in the, in the psalm that reminds you of that, that just one thing that, that you want to take away and to meditate, think about this week, maybe one of the aspects of a relationship that you're going to work on this week, Will you put an arrow? I don't care where you point the arrow, but an arrow, all right? Three things. A light bulb, kind of highlighted bit in there. Secondly, a question mark again, things that you're not quite sure about or want to know, go into deeper. Thirdly, something that applies to you, all right? Will you do that now? Feel free to talk about it if you want to. It's not a silent thing. Perhaps just a... You don't have to rush, but just perhaps a minute more. Right, can we just stop there? You don't need to, to say anything, about, you know, certainly not about, about what applies to you, but any one or two people just prepared to say what their light bulb moment might have been in, in that, what passage, right? Yes. Okay, wait, right? That word, wait, okay, which involves patience and, and, and actually listening and... and and it's hard, right? You know, in church, when you have two minutes silence and everybody's thinking, oh, gosh, this is awful. Silence. And sh- because we, we're not very good at that. Anything else? Light bulb moments. My light and my salvation. My light and my salvation. <laughs> Any others? Dwell, yeah, that, 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 yeah, and for me it's that word dwell, it's just a lovely, lovely old word, which, which you know, yeah. Any others? Be merciful, Be merciful. Be merciful yeah? Rebecca? My heart will not fear. My heart will not fear, yeah, 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 Kathy? I'm going to read it out, but all verses two and three. Yeah, okay, all right, one more, <coughs> Jeff? Seek his face. Seek his face, wow, yes, gosh, if you, yeah. I mean, that, that's something for all of us, isn't it, as well, I think. Yeah. Okay, um, let's just pray and then uh, um, hand back over. Father, with those thoughts, words, phrases, pictures in our minds, we just ask that you would encourage each one of us in our relationship with you, that we would be as excited today and in the coming days as we were excited when we first knew you in our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.